Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy whose baby's got a locomotive. Here is the captain. Chugga, chugga, choo, choo. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Tiger Chainsaw Arms by the good folks down at Singing River Brewing Company. Why the crazy name? Probably because it's a crazy good beer. Tiger Chainsaw Arms is a Belgian triple American IPA hybrid, just like the exotic cat slash power tool featured on the can art. It's exotic and weird and wild, and you're going to love it. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps, and here's some of our friends that helped us out with this week's beer run. First up, a big cheers to Judy and Gehanna, Ohio. And a big shout out to Darlene Danielson in Sugar Grove, Illinois. Thank you to everyone for helping us out with this week's beer fund. If you want to help us out with next week's beer run, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can follow the Colonel on Untapped and on Twitter as well. So you can be in the know of when we're dropping episodes or when we're dropping some bonus content. Also, sign up. Also, go run, hurry, hurry, run today. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are doing some stuff, working some stuff out to deliver you some new content on the YouTube channel. So, So make sure you subscribe to that. Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The last time that Nico Lisa was heard from was around 5 p.m. on the 1st. This is when he spoke with his grandmother via phone. She called him. He actually picked up. He said he cannot talk to her at that time, and he would call her back. This is the last interaction that Nico has with any of his family. At some point on the same day, and this is weird, Captain, because we're already talking about New York, and then we're talking about Nico dropping Robbie off, or supposedly that's how the story goes anyway, that Nico dropped off Robbie at his parents' home in Michigan. And then one thing that we do know that happened for certain is that somebody retrieves a Western Union money order for $90 made out to Nico. He picks this up at a Western Union location that is in the state of Ohio, in our state. So they steal the truck in New York. Eyewitnesses of that. No eyewitnesses of him dropping off Robbie in Michigan. And no eyewitnesses of him picking up this money order. That's how the timeline works out. Now, we should point out here before we move too far along. Nico's family they're a little suspicious of Robbie Knight and Robbie's family, you know, so they're getting this information from Robbie Knight's family that Robbie was dropped off by Nico. Nico may have robbed Robbie at gunpoint before dropping him off. Again, the only place that that story comes from is Robbie and his family. I'm not saying that it's not true. Just pointing out that Nico's family at least calls this into question. So we should as well, as we continue on with the rest of this timeline. This will make that money order pick up in Ohio even more questionable, right? We know that happened, but what happens here is on October 3rd, Monica receives an envelope in the mail that's postmarked October 1st. Inside of this envelope is her son's driver's license, Nico's driver's license. So he has a driver's license, no vehicle until he and Robbie steal this vehicle or one of them stole it. There's a note inside the envelope as well that says that someone had found Nico's driver's license on the street in front of the post office in Hornell, New York. Again, this is about 20 miles from Jasper where he was living at the time or supposed to be living at the time. 
Now, keep in mind, his father lived in Hornell, so it wouldn't be out of question that he would be there. What I'm throwing in here as a big question mark is if he lost his license in New York, drops it, or some people have wondered, did he drop it on purpose as like a a call for help or or to try to warn somebody that, that something was going on? He picks up the Western Union in Ohio. Now, I know that not everybody follows protocol all of the time. He would need his driver's license or some form of ID to to retrieve that Western Union money order, which we know that he did. But his license, he would not have had that at the time that he picked up that money order. Right. Is it possible that he had a student ID or some other form of ID that they would let him pick up this money? Which is possible. And we'll... we'll s- I imagine we'll get back to the money order in a little more detail as we go through the timeline. But what I'm pointing out here is the money order was made out to Nico Lisi and it was retrieved from a Western union location, in Ohio. All of that is fact that we cannot change that. That's what happened. What I'm pointing out is because he didn't have his driver's license with him. I don't think that any of us can say with 100% certainty that he was the actual person that picked up the money order. Yeah, basically what you're saying is somebody picked up the money order. We just have no way of confirming that. Right. The The money order was picked up. It was made out to Nico Lisi. It was retrieved. I don't think we can say one with 100% certainty who picked it up. Because if if whoever gave the money order out, if they allowed somebody to retrieve it without showing ID, or like you said... Could somebody have had a debit card or a credit card just with the name on there, no picture? And hey, I'm I'm Nick from True Crime Garage, and I'm retrieving this uh, Western Union money order for ninety bucks, but you don't know it because I'm showing you a debit card with Nico Lisi's name on it, and you just believe it to be me. So that part's a little wonky, right? Just because that Western Union is picked up, I don't know that we can one hundred percent say that it was Nico that picked it up. That he was at that Western Union location in Ohio on October the 1st. This whole story is a little wonky and full of people that are full of malarkey. Some people were really put off by this driver's license being found. A lot of people question that big time. I don't question it so much because I've actually done that. I've found a driver's license before and mailed it to the address on the license. Now, just just to clarify... It's a driver's license. So Nico has his driver's license. He just doesn't have a vehicle. That's what's reported. It, okay. For all I know, Captain, it could be a state, state ID. ID. But but the way that it's reported is it's reported as a driver's license. Now, according to Nico's mother, Monica, she somehow was able to speak with the person, the man that actually that f- says he found the driver's license and mailed it to her. And then she also says that he was interviewed by police and Monica says that she believes that this man had nothing to do with Nico disappearing, that he was just, he just did the right thing. He found a license and was attempting to return it to the person that lost it. Now, what I question about the license is how did it get lost? Is it just, he happened to drop it or if something, if I were being taken against my will, I would make every attempt to clue some people in that, hey, something's happened to me. Right. Mom can't get a hold of Nico. And she believes that he's involved in some kind of stolen vehicle situation. His state ID or driver's license turns up in her mailbox. So she's going to, as we said, she reports her son missing and also makes the police aware that he may have something to do with this stolen vehicle. She's trying to do the right thing, but she's also mostly worried about finding her son. So by Wednesday, October 5th, she's frantic and she's calling everybody that she can think of her and her husband find out that Robbie's grandmother that, uh, through Robbie's grandmother, that Robbie had ended up at home in Michigan, Monica and her husband, Nico's stepfather, they speak with Robbie's father via phone. There's a couple of things that Monica says that are weird about this phone call. Again, they're already suspicious of 
Robbie Knight. This is where they become suspicious of Robbie Knight's family. On the phone with Nico's family, Robbie's father, Robert, tells Nico's family that he had never seen Nico, even though, according to the story, Nico dropped Robbie off there. Goes on to tell them that Robbie, once he ended up here back at home, he's been home all weekend. Meaning after Robbie showed up, he never left the house again, never left this man's sight again, which Nico's family finds this to be very suspicious because they're saying Robbie Knight's father offered up this information, even though nobody's asking where his son or sons were, uh, because Robbie has a brother named Christopher. And that was part of the conversation. Robbie's been here all weekend. Christopher has been here all weekend. It's almost like creating an alibi. Yeah. Pretty strange when you're not even asked where these people were. I'd call that being a little fishy. According to the information I have here, Captain, is that the same day that the missing persons report is filed in New York for Nico, that same day, Michigan State Police go to Robbie's house in Romulus, Michigan. They want to talk to Robbie, of course, because now he's linked to this stolen truck. So they bring him into the police station to question him about one, where's Nico? And two, where's this truck? During this questioning, and this goes bad really quick, it it sounds to me like they don't get very far in the questioning, or at least they don't get very much in the way of information. So this is because Robbie suffers some kind of meltdown during this questioning. We don't know exactly what happened, but it's bad enough that they take him to the hospital. The police take him to the hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. That's beyond strange. And and that's, I believe, the first time we've ever heard of somebody being questioned by the police and then taken for a psych evaluation. I just figured out my cover. If I'm ever involved in something horrible and need to weasel my way out of that interrogation room, oh, baby, I'm breaking down like you've never seen before. Like, Worse than Tom Petty said in in Breakdown. I'm breaking down big time. I'm getting out of there. Robbie gets sent to the hospital, and he's there. They keep him there at a mental hospital until Saturday the 9th. And during that time, during that time period, the police don't talk to him. They don't, they are not afforded the opportunity to speak with him. So this gives a lot of time and a lot of days to figure out what am I going to tell these people? Number one. But then it gets worse because on the 10th, the following day after Robbie is released from the mental hospital, he posts one of those messages that you do not want to see on social because that tells you your friend is in a bad place, that that they probably need some help. So this is on the 10th. Robbie posts on his Facebook page at 3.47 p.m., quote, can someone send me some love? I just got out of the hospital. I'm at a low place, but I'm getting better. I need someone to show me some love. Now, that's 3.47 p.m. Sometime after 8 p.m. that same day, Robbie Knight dies. Oh, shit. According to Nico's mother, Monica, she says that she learned from a police report that she obtained through a FOIA request that Robbie OD'd on his own prescription drugs. Now, to be perfectly clear, whether this was an accident or deliberate, we do not know. That's that's unclear here. Well, and we don't know when he was prescribed the, this medication. Was this something he's been subscribed, he was prescribed to for years and that he took with him from New York to Michigan? Or was this something that they gave to him after he spoke with police, after being put in the psych evaluation. Right. You're exactly right. My guess would be that it was from the mental hospital, but we can't say that with any level of certainty here. But the, the what's really disturbing to this case is now we have someone who could very likely shed some serious light on what Nico was up to or what was going on with the stolen truck situation they're no longer around to provide answers. Well, very sad that we're losing a life, but also we're losing this information about Nico. Of course, that's going to shock and scare Nico's family all at the same time. But while we're on the subject of Facebook here, yeah, Captain, book of faces, 
Nico's family at some point becomes aware that Nico's Facebook page had been deleted. That's fishy. This is because the family, they, they try to access, you know, they go to his Facebook page to see if there's any activity on it while he's missing. The page does not exist anymore. I was just going to say that there's, there's so many strange things. I mean, we can't prove that Nico was in Ohio. We can't even prove that Nico was in Michigan. Like you said, there. then Robbie's family is establishing alibis, not just for him, but for his brother as well. It's It's beyond... Strange. Then you have Robbie where he's not going to talk to the, the police. Oh, you want me to get a psych, psych evaluation? Well, I'm not going to speak with you. And then he dies. And this is after he, wasn't he the one that said, you know, hey, I'm not going to bother you anymore? Yeah, Robbie said something cryptic to his grandmother when she drops him off at the cabin at what is Nico's family's cabin. Says something like, I'll I'll be getting out of your life now, or I'm giving you your life back. That's what he said, which yeah, almost sounds like, hey, I've been a burden to you the last several years. I'm freeing you of that burden, which may mean something as simple as, hey, I mean, Robbie's 20 at the time. Did he die by suicide? We can't say that, but right. he does die shortly after that interaction with his grandmother. So was that his plan all along, or was it just something as simple as I'm 20 and you don't have to care for me. You don't have to provide a, a shelter and food for me. I'm going to, I'm going to relieve you of, of your responsibilities and your duties that have been weighing you down for a while. But well, maybe they thought, look, maybe they were running from something. We did something bad. We're going to get out of town. We're going to start a new life in the process. Yeah. We're going to steal a truck to get us there. There's a credit card in this truck. We're going to use that for gas and food. And this is going to get us to Michigan, and so we can start over. And as long as we don't get caught, then we won't have to deal with any of the charges from the stolen car, the stolen credit card, stuff like that. And then when you get caught, it's like he's not, he's still running by this OD. Like you said, you can't 100% say that it was an accident or it was on purpose. Well, and again, the truck thing's confusing too, because did, did he steal it? Did Robbie steal it? Did they steal it together? And where the heck is it at? Do you steal the truck so you can get out of Dodge or did you get out of Dodge because you stole a truck? Right. So this is where the Tennessee connection all comes back in. So we've got New York, Pennsylvania. If, if they were to have traveled and everything went down the way that Robbie says it went down then that meant that him and Nico went from New York to Pennsylvania to Ohio up to Michigan, and then Nico went back to Ohio to retrieve that Western Union $90 transfer. But So remember, Nico spent his junior year at Franklin High School in Franklin, Tennessee. And of course, during that year, he's going to make some friends while he's there. Monica, his mother, says that she's not really certain if he stayed in touch with any of these people once he moved back to New York for his senior year or even after high school in New York. Now, he could have just because she doesn't know that he if he stayed in touch doesn't mean that he didn't. But now we're at the situation where police are looking for Nico. They use his phone records and his phone did ping in Nashville, Tennessee on October 1st. And it last pinged in Franklin, Tennessee at 5.05 p.m. Eastern time, which would be 4.05 Central time there on October 1st. So the ping that takes place at 5.05 Eastern time, this is when his grandmother called him. Remember, somebody picked up the phone, said, I can't talk right now. I'll call back. So the phone records reflect that indeed on September 30th through October 1st, my notes say Nico here, but I think maybe we should point out that maybe what's more accurate is Nico's phone traveled right. from New York to Michigan and then down to Tennessee. The phone records also showed evidence of a series of calls that involved some interactions once he gets to Tennessee or on his way to Tennessee. The unfortunate thing, though, is nobody has Nico's actual phone. They're going off of phone records and what they can get from the phone company, this being law enforcement and 
Nico's family. What they cannot get access to is the content of Nico's text, which is incredibly unfortunate because, I mean, we're talking about 2011 and we're talking about a kid that's 18, almost 19 years old. Yeah, there's probably more communication going through text messages than are going through by actual phone conversation. I would bet you that most of the important stuff that we want to know is would be in text. If if you were hoping to find something, that's where I would be looking. Now, at this point, Monica, again, I give kudos to her. She's taking matters into her own hands as much as she can. Remember, Nico's phone was on the family account, so this is going to get her access to certain information on that phone. What she does is she gets a list of contacts that were on that phone, and she's calling everybody on those contacts to see if anybody's seen him, heard from him. Now, some of his contacts, this would be evidence that maybe he was staying in touch with these people. Or maybe these are just leftover numbers and contacts that were on his phone from when he spent his junior year in Franklin, Tennessee. Right. But some of the numbers in his contacts are the 615 area code, which is Franklin and Nashville, Tennessee area. Again, she's calling all these numbers. Finally, one of these phone calls pays off. This is when a young man in the 615 area code area calls her back. He calls back on October 15th. We can only call him by his first initial. So we will refer to him as E. This is because this this name is known to law enforcement, but some of these names that we are going to refer to just by initial, right? law enforcement have stated to Nico's family that they've been advised to not use these names publicly. To, they've been advised, please keep speaking about your son's missing persons case. Because getting it out there in the media can help, but we would advise you against saying these persons' actual names. So E went to Franklin High School with Nico during the 2009-2010 school year when Nico was down in Tennessee. So E tells Monica, Nico's mother, that yes, Nico was here at my place the night of October 1st. He says that he picked up Nico about two blocks from his home. The home is located on Flintlock Drive in Franklin, and he brings Nico back to the house. He says the two of them played soccer with some buddies, and then Nico spent the night. Nico did some laundry, and then the next day, Nico packed up his stuff and left. He was carrying a backpack, but he says that at no point did he see a vehicle. And he also tells Monica, I don't know where he was going even though he left Monica's sister-in-law, the one that Nico lived with in Franklin knew this family and confirmed that Nico had spent time there when he lived in Franklin two years earlier. The other thing that's weird here though, captain is though, although he told Monica that he had not seen Nico in two years, we know from the phone records that Nico called E's phone number 30 plus times in one day. This is, That's a lot of times. Yeah. September 30th into October 1st. E, or at least E's phone number, called Nico's phone back several times. So there's a lot of communication there. And where does E live again? Flintlock Drive in Franklin, Tennessee. So I'm trying to keep this all straight in my head. They, They leave from New York possibly go to Michigan, drop Robbie off. Robbie's claiming that Nico robs him. Nico goes to Ohio, collects money, and then goes to Tennessee, where this E character claims that they hung out in Tennessee. Correct. And he says that other people hung out there with them. And this is where everything gets really wonky, because we're going to keep saying that Nico went from New York up to Michigan, through Ohio, and down to Tennessee. But what I think we should point out is the only thing that we can definitively say is that Nico's phone made those travels. Mm -hmm. Because, all right, so let's go back to the grandma phone call because this is a big 
pivotal point in the story, in my opinion, because now we know we have the phone records and the phone is traveling to Michigan, then to Tennessee. This is great because it gives some kind of trail for Nico's family to try to follow. But what we have here is the phone call from grandma at 5.05 PM. That's the ping that puts Nico or at least his phone in Franklin, Tennessee at that time. So that goes along with this E person story. But if you ask grandma today, she says, now I'm not certain that it was Nico that I spoke to on the phone for years. She said that it was Nico. Now she questions that. And the other problem with this case is the multiple law enforcement jurisdictions that are at play here. The New York state police were in charge of the case at one point, but for the first few years in their investigation, it seems that they believe that Nico was on the run, which would make some sense. The investigators seem to embrace the theory that Nico was anxious, wanted to elude that rape charge. He's having fallouts with his family. He stole a truck that he simply just split town that he got out of Dodge. We have seen time and time again that when law enforcement or police believe that someone has voluntarily disappeared, that can dramatically impact the actual investigation. But here we have the issue of multiple jurisdictions at play. We have Monica, who's dealing with the New York State Police, about her missing son. We have the Franklin, Tennessee Sheriff's Department, who are now dealing with the possibility that Nico and the stolen vehicle may be in their county. We also have the fact that the Michigan State Police are completely stymied when Robbie Knight dies. Fall is just around the corner. As the seasons change, now is the perfect time to reset and think about little changes you can make in your daily routine to better your health. Care of is a subscription service that makes it easy. They ship high quality, personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders conveniently to you at your door every month. Start by taking a short in-depth quiz about your lifestyle and health goals for a personalized recommendation. No more guesswork about what supplements are best suited for you. Staying consistent with your routine is easy too. Care-of's free app gives you daily reminders to take your vitamins and even rewards you for doing so with exclusive discounts and merch just by tracking your progress. Each shipment comes with a customized booklet showing you exactly what is in your individual daily packs and why it is recommended specifically for you and your health goals. Look, the colonel doesn't always take care of himself and does not always eat right. I love how easy care of is. I took the quiz and they hooked me up with the right products. The colonel is currently taking plant protein, vanilla flavored, which I love, and it's helping me to reach my health goals and it's giving me the vitamins and nutrition that I was lacking. For 50% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter code GARAGE50. That's takecareof.com and code GARAGE50 for 50% off your first care of order. All right, we are back, everybody. Cheers to the people in the front and the people in the back and to the colonel. Cheers to you, Captain, and cheers to hopefully Nico's family getting some information, getting some answers soon. Our timeline, we're going to go to March of 2012. This is Monica, Nico's mother, conducting her own investigation, and she's been looking for her son since October of 2011. But in March of 2012, she traveled to Franklin, Tennessee, this to talk to the teen who says that he saw Nico the night of October 1st. So she goes to this kid's home. 
she sits down with E, the, the teenager that we're calling E, and E's father. And what Monica learned from them really didn't help the situation at all. So this is from the Tennessean in 2016 that's quoting Monica in this situation, saying, I said to the young man, you haven't seen him in two years. What did he say? What did he want? Where did he go? And he couldn't deliver anything positive or anything concrete as far as information for me. So Monica says that she gets three different versions of how Nico got to their house. E told her one time that he picked Nico up two blocks away. That was the original story. Then he said Nico got dropped off at their home in another version of that same story. And then later he says that Nico drove up. But this young man, E, denies ever seeing the truck. E and his father, for the most part, according to Monica, were very casual, but they were also very vague on any of the details. She wasn't able to get really much in the way of answers from them regarding her son or what the manner of his transportation was. Well, again, Nico is in this place in his life, this dark cloud, if you will. And on top of that, he's making bad decisions. He's hanging out with people that also make bad decisions. And we don't know much about this E guy, but if he's hanging out with Nico around this time period, then E is probably a person that's making bad decisions. And you just can't trust everything that they're saying because they might be telling you a story that makes them look better. What's weird here too, Captain, is... This is when Monica finds out about the Western Union MoneyGram for $90 that someone picked up that we're told that Nico picked up in Ohio. And this is because E was the one who had sent the MoneyGram, but he refused to tell Nico's mother, Monica, why they sent the money. Of course, Monica says that she just assumes the money was for gas. Right. So he could continue to drive the truck that he was making his way to Tennessee. I do want to point out, you know, there's always these little missteps, you know, not all the time, but, but oftentimes there are these little missteps. There's so many cases out there that don't have missteps by the police. And we don't discuss those because they get solved. Right. Right. We don't hear about all the things that they got right, because when they get it right, they find the person that perpetrated or they find the missing person and everything's squared away. But here we have a missing person with a set of bizarre events and behaviors, in my opinion, leading up to his disappearance. It's really actually even hard for me to say, did he disappear in New York? Did he disappear in Michigan? Did he disappear in Tennessee? I I can't look at this information and decipher which of those is most correct. What's interesting to me, Captain, is that, and this is incredibly surprising, it seems that there was never an APB out for this stolen truck. Even though it's reported stolen, we know that it passes through multiple states. You know, you would think that maybe it went through some tolls or toll records that would be have some of the information on this truck. I think that that was a misstep here by investigators. Now, who knows if they had put out an APB and it didn't get out until October 2nd or 3rd or 4th or 5th, it might have been too late. Because based off of the phone records and based off of all of the information we have, if Nico did in fact travel from New York to Michigan down to Tennessee, he would have completed his trip to Tennessee before those dates. As of today, have we found that truck? Yes, the truck has been located, but it took several years. So let's get into that. But before we lead up to that, I want to point out another part of the problem. We've already pointed out that Robbie Knight who was traveling with Nico, who was at least traveled with him in the stolen vehicle while it was in the state of New York. We know that that is fact. We pointed out that he passed away, that he OD'd shortly after Nico disappears. But then in 2012, Robbie Knight's father, who had had some communication and interaction with Nico's family, he passes away as well. This is not helpful to the investigation because remember Monica And Nico's family have said that they were suspicious of Robbie Knight, of Robbie Knight's father, and Robbie's brother, Christopher. Christopher, from my understanding, was later incarcerated on charges not related in any way or form to this case. This is one of the most bizarre missing person cases that I think we have covered in the last six years. 
This takes us to November of 2015. Now, we still have the New York State Police, the the investigators from that agency. They're still the lead technically on this case at this point. They go to Romulus, Michigan, this to question the two people in Robbie's family who were still alive. This seems a little after the fact to me, right? There's four people in this family. Nico was supposedly close enough to this home that he drops off Robbie or robbed Robbie. Two of these family members have passed away before New York State Police go out to interview these individuals. But again, state police believe that Nico had left voluntarily. In law enforcement's defense, they were, or Robbie was, questioned by local law enforcement, which led to him being psych evaluated. Correct. And so what we have here, Captain, is some new information that comes out because of these interviews. They learn from Christopher. He's not admitting to really much. Uh, he's not doesn't have any information on where Nico went, but he admits that he and Robbie, his brother Robbie, who's now deceased, they were the ones that shut down Nico's Facebook page. They did that from their house. This was something that was done sometime after Robbie showed up back in Michigan, but before Robbie died a few days later. So this makes you wonder, even though Christopher gives this information, he's not incredibly helpful, but was there some kind of conspiracy to make Nico completely disappear? We know his phone was shut off at some point. Yeah. Or maybe they, maybe they knew he was having a, okay. uh, Hypothetically, Nico's having a hard time communicating with his phone or his phone's not working or something. Maybe he didn't have a charger and he takes off on the road. Now he doesn't have a charger. So he then robs Robbie. So now he has his phone, but we're going to shut that down. And well, he can communicate with people through Facebook and we're going to shut that down as well. Well, my head goes to this end of it because one of the first things I look at in these cases is trying to figure out, did this person hit the reset button and and choose to disappear or are they running from something or did something terrible happen to them? Where I go with this is I I see the Facebook page shut down and I go, okay, well maybe Nico shut it down because he does not want to have any communication with his family and he wants to disappear. But now we find out years later that no, these two guys, Robbie and Christopher, they shut it down. They so shut down the communication. Yeah. Why did they shut down Nico's Facebook page? Is that to make Nico disappear because they did something to him? Or was that because would there be something incriminating that somebody could find on the Facebook page? Yeah, very good point. And this is why you're the colonel. And they don't let me leave my house. <laughs> He's not allowed to leave just research cases give us the information as long as i wear that ankle bracelet i can i can go in in one handcuff yeah so this leads us up to the point that you wanted to get to here captain july 2016 this is it when e the person that we are calling e he's finally questioned by the new york state police and the franklin police department This was the first time that New York State Police came to Franklin to talk to E and his family in person. They've had some communication over the phone, but this was the first time they're going to interview him in person. This is five years after Nico goes missing. So Nico's family says that E was initially helpful in the investigation, but at some point lawyered up and he shut up. But we know that police got a tip while they were on the ground in Franklin, Tennessee. This is because the truck that Robbie and Nico were driving, that Nico was believed to have driven to Tennessee, or at least that's the story that we're getting told, was found. They found the truck. It was found stripped and dismantled in a locked, detached garage of a home in Sylvan Park, which is a residential area in Nashville. So this is about 21 miles from Franklin, Tennessee. A statement from the Franklin Police Department posted by Lieutenant Charles Warner on July 22nd, 2016, reads as follows. New lead uncovers dismantled truck missing New York teen last seen driving in Franklin. A cold case investigation into the disappearance of a missing New York teen has led to the discovery of the truck he drove to Franklin. 
Following a lead yesterday afternoon, Franklin police detectives and New York State police investigators found the stripped-down truck locked inside the garage of a middle Tennessee home. The discovery only increases the concern of foul play in the disappearance of Nico Lisi, who was last seen on Flintlock Drive in Franklin on October 1st, 2011. Investigators are hopeful that forensic processing of the truck will help to provide answers in the case. Police urge anyone with information to come forward. So that's 2016. So now we sit back and we look at that and we soak that all in. We absorb that information and we go, "Eh." unfortunately, the truck probably didn't provide any answers forensically at all, right? Because we've not heard anything. Well, and they said the vehicle was stripped. Yes. But it goes back to this idea, like you were talking about with the Facebook page. Is it to stop communication or is it to erase some kind of evidence or hide some kind of evidence? And we know with with we know with Robbie's father, he seemed to be establishing alibis for his sons. And then we find this vehicle which is hidden, right? It's this individual was hiding this vehicle for some reason. Well, and here's the thing. Let's go in in depth here. The truck, when they found it was completely dismantled. It had no remaining parts on it. So we're talking no lights, no wires, knobs, no engine, no doors, no tires, nothing. All that remained of this truck was the gray painted frame of a truck bed and the cab. So if police were planning on searching it, as they said in their release for forensic evidence, well, you know me, Captain, I'm a betting man. I got a crispy piece of paper here that's green in color, and it's got a picture of Benjamin Franklin on it in the center. I would wager that against other pieces of paper with other important figures on them that they didn't find anything. I mean, this is years later. This thing is completely stripped down. And in fact... Someone had even attempted to remove all of the vehicle identification numbers off of, off of this piece of tin. What the reason that they know that they found the right truck is somebody missed one and they found the VIN on some place of this dismantled truck. Right. Because let's go back to the beginning. This truck was a gold truck, right? Yes. And now, now this vehicle doesn't even have any paint on it. And luckily, again, a lot of these criminals are stupid. And luckily, they made a mistake and left one of the VIN numbers. Right. And what we have here is they do not, police do not release the exact location of where the truck was found because it is found on private property. It's found in a detached garage of a, of a home that is owned by a, a family, I'm guessing. What we do know is that the something that Nico's family says that they learned during the course of this investigation. They say that at some point they overheard that the truck was found at a certain address in Nashville and that Monica was later able to piece together some more information based on other information that she's received. So the house where the truck was found stripped and locked in the separate garage belongs to a family who lives in Franklin, Tennessee. This is not, we need to be clear here. This is not the person who we are calling E. This is not E's family home on Flint lock drive that we've referenced a couple of times. So this is another family. Now in 2011, when Nico went missing and the house that the truck was later found in, it was considered a party house. The Franklin-based parents own the home, but their teen son, who we've been instructed to call Jay, lived there. So Jay and E, they know each other, and Nico knew them both. A family member of Jay, whose parents own the home, was renting the home in 2016 and was the one who allowed the New York State Police investigators to access the garage. So what's really weird here is that back in December of 2011, Monica receives a tip on Facebook from a girl who lived in Tennessee who gave her the name of Jay's family and suggested that she talk to Jay and his parents. So there was somebody that came forward 
years earlier saying, hey, you might want to talk to this J fella and his parents. And that's ultimately where they end up finding the truck stripped down in a locked, detached garage. And this case is so difficult for me because the truck being found in Tennessee, to me, leans more towards the idea that maybe Robbie was telling the truth and he dropped me off in Michigan and then he took off down to Ohio, collected some money from there, went to Tennessee. But then it becomes a big question of foul play because you have this vehicle that somebody's obviously trying to uh, destroy or make it so nobody knows who this vehicle belongs to. Or is it simply that Nico was some bad things were happening in his life and he was also making some bad decisions and then he made some more bad decisions to run from those. Well, plug your ears here, captain, because I don't want your head to explode because this case is very frustrating to look at and this will make it even more frustrating. So the family that owns the home, remember they, when it was found, the family that owned it at the time in 2016 they granted the police access to the garage. There doesn't appear that they're trying to hide anything. They let them look in the garage. They find this dismantled truck. They find a VIN, a vehicle identification number on this scrap of metal that confirms that it was the truck that was stolen, reported stolen in New York. But this is 2016. The family that allowed access to the police to the garage, they say, we don't know how the truck got here. We have no information on the truck. Why don't you have any information on the truck? Oh, because Jay, who lived here, who knew the person that we are calling E, who also knew Nico, he died in 2014, two years earlier of a suspected overdose. The second individual, the second eyewitness to die of an overdose. Yes, exactly. So this really leads us into really the theory portion of our show, because with all these people that have passed away that likely had information, we no longer have access to that information. So we're hoping police investigators, Nico's family are all hoping that those people before they passed away, told somebody, whatever it is that they knew of the situation. This is a case that needs to blow up on the blog. So if you have a thought that you think would help this case at all, go to our blog at truecrimegarage.com and and leave a comment on this episode. So when we discuss theories here, we got to point out the obvious first. There's almost an infinite number of theories in this case because we have a lot of confusing information and a lot of the people that may know something, well, they are not around to tell. They are dead. They've passed away. Now, one theory that I think that we can dismiss, and I I say this with great sadness, and I wish that I could offer more of a light at the end of the tunnel for Nico's family, but the theory that I think that I can kind of dismiss from my investigation is that Nico is alive and well somewhere after leaving to start a new life. This to me seems very unlikely in this situation, and I say that for a multitude of reasons. One, given how close he was at one time with his family his mother extended and otherwise Uh, for the record, Monica has said unequivocally that, that she does not believe that her son is still alive based off of the relationship that she had with him and that he would not hurt her and hurt the family for this long without some form of communication. She and the investigators now, even though the state police at one time believe he left voluntarily, And that may be the case. He may have left their state voluntarily, but it seems like investigators now and Nico's family now believe that foul play is responsible for whatever happened to Nico. And the other thing that we should point out too, is that some people are going to go, well, Nick, calm down, buddy. He was running from a rape charge. Well, that charge was eventually dropped. The charge against those other boys or men or whoever they were that that were the allegations were put forward of, of rape on those guys, those charges were dropped as well. Yeah, and that's a big thing because if 
to me, this idea that he was running from something, that's what he's running from. He's running from that statutory rape charge. But then bad shit happened. And if he was only running from that charge, and because that would have dramatically affected his future, once that charge is dropped, do you come forward? But maybe because of him running from those charges and making bad decisions like stealing a vehicle, maybe that would make him not want to come forward. Well, and to further bolster this opinion that foul play is involved here, Monica actually told True Crime Garage some relatively new information that's not really out there to the masses. And so we'll share that with you now. This went down in March of 2017. Monica says that the New York State Police informed the Steuben County, New York DA, that they believed that they had reason to believe and found this, these reasons in the course of their investigation that Nico was killed shortly after arriving in Tennessee. They said that they had obtained reliable information that Nico had died by means of homicide. So that really helps in the way of creating some kind of breadcrumb trail where we called everything into question earlier. We now sit here with this information and go, well, the New York State Police seem to believe enough so to tell the district attorney of Steuben County mm -hmm. that what we came up with, what we found in our investigation was that, yes, Nico left New York voluntarily. Nico arrived in Tennessee. He was physically present at some point in Tennessee, and he's no longer with us because he died by means of a homicide. Well, and remember what his mother was saying and what the family was talking about, how he left Tennessee abruptly and to do so just because you were truant from school doesn't make a lot of sense. Was he trying to get out of Dodge? Gets out of Dodge. You know, is he trying to get out of Tennessee for some reason? Something bad happened. He goes back home. Some bad shit happens. He he then makes a break for it. And then he's met with foul play in Tennessee based off of something that happened months earlier. Here's one thing that I want to circle back to, because when we look at these cases, I'm always trying to evaluate these individuals, these characters, if you will, within the story. And one of the characters is Nico's mother, Monica. I have found time and time again, her actions to be incredibly level-headed, right? Oh, I, I'm not going to dodge the police. I'm going to inform them that my son's missing and also inform them that he may be involved in a stolen vehicle situation. If you find that truck, you might find my son. Right. Very level-headed thinking. Now, one interaction that I cannot vouch for. I was not present when this inter interaction went, went down, but what we are told by Monica and her family is that when they spoke with Robbie Knight's father, Robert Knight, the second who is now deceased and Robbie Knight, the third is now deceased. When they spoke with Robbie Knight's father, the father said, Nico dropped him off here and my son Robbie and my son Christopher have been home the whole weekend. They've not gone anywhere since Robbie got back according to Monica. And that's the thing. When you review somebody's actions and their behaviors, she's not the type that comes off as all. Oh, she's just suspicious of everybody because she's, she's pointed to certain people that are involved throughout the story and said, I don't think that person has anything to do with this. Or I don't think that this person was up to no good. They were just trying to help out. L example being the person that found the driver's license or the state ID and mailed it to her. And so 
she seems to be very level-headed, and yet she says she was very, almost instantly suspicious of this statement. Robbie and my son Christopher have been here the whole weekend, ever since he got back. Offering up this information, creating an alibi when one was not requested. To me, the police say that they have evidence, they have reason to believe that he was killed shortly after arriving in Tennessee. I'm starting to wonder, did Nico arrive in Tennessee by himself? Or do we have one or both of these Knight brothers in the truck with him? And then this whole case, too, is it's like it's like a snake chasing its tail, eating itself, right? Cannibalizing itself. It's it's the chicken or the egg in a lot of these questions. Did they steal the truck because they needed to leave or did they leave because they stole the truck? What happened after they got to Michigan? At what point do things turn for Nico, turn bad for Nico from these people that are supposed to be his friends? Everybody that we mentioned was considered to be a friend of his at one point. This E fella, this J fella, Robbie, all who have passed away, by the way, some of them from drug overdoses, accidental or purposely, we don't know. Did something drive these individuals? Did they do something that they, that drove them to that end? And it's, why did they go to Tennessee? What happened with the truck? Was he killed because of the truck? Did they try to sell it for parts? Did they try to fence a stolen truck and, th- and that went wrong? And that's what happened to Nico. It's a lot of, of the chicken or the egg. Just to touch on something that you were saying did he arrive in Tennessee? Did Nico arrive in Tennessee in that truck by himself? Or was Robbie or his brother with him? Or was there a confrontation like Robbie claims that was a little more heated or a little more involved? Or maybe Nico knew more information about Robbie than he wanted him to know. And they chased him down to Tennessee. In November of 2017, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation took over this case. And in September of 2020, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation premiered a video on this investigation into the disappearance of Nico. This video shows the home where the truck was found and shows the truck as it is now itself. And also includes a plea for information. As far as Nico's mother, Monica, goes, she says she is long since past worrying about justice or convicting anyone or retribution. She has spent the past 11 years plastering flyers up, traveling to talk to witnesses or potential witnesses. She's spent some of that time harassing the police for information, also attending missing persons rallies and conferences, creating the search for Nico Lisi Facebook page. And of course, making her rounds to different shows and podcasts like ours and speaking with us after more than a decade of searching, she is exhausted and has just one goal. She just wants to get her son's remains back. She does not believe that he's alive. She says if he were, he would have been in contact, especially after the charges against him were dropped. And she told Williamson homepage.com quote, my main focus is just to find my son's remains. If anyone, if anybody knows anything, I want them to come forward to police, to me anonymously to either. I don't care. My focus is to find my son. My focus is not on the people responsible anymore. I need to know where my son is. The investigators from TBI continue to seek information from anyone that was hanging out at the house where the truck was found or remember being at a party at that, what was known to be a party house at one point. The investigator says that someone knows how the truck got there and someone knows how it was dismantled and that people in the Nashville and Franklin area know exactly what happened to Nico. Monica tells us that there are several families in Tennessee who are involved in what happened to her son. Nico Lisi is a Caucasian male with brown hair and brown eyes, five foot 10 to five foot 11 inches tall, 160 pounds. He was last seen wearing a black hooded sweatshirt, red shorts, sneakers, and a silver crucifix. 
Nico had several tattoos, including an unfinished guardian angel and a crescent moon on his left side, four Chinese symbols on the back of his upper right arm, and a large kneeling woman with a devil's tail on his right side. Anyone with any information about Nico or his disappearance should call 1-800-TBI-FIND. That's 1-800-TBI-F-I-N-D. Or submit a tip online by emailing tips to TBI at tn.gov. The Lisi family has offered up $2,500 in reward money for information leading to Nico's whereabouts. And the Franklin Police and Crime Stoppers are offering up an additional reward of up to $1,000 for information in this case. I want to thank you so much. I want to give you hugs and kisses if I can. Let me get close to you. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful people? Yes, we do, Captain. This week we are recommending a book called Ohio Heist, Historic Bank Holdups, Train Robberies, Jewel Stings, and More by Jane Torzillo. You're going to want to check this out if you love you some true crime, if you love you some Ohio true crime. This book features all of the great bank holdups, train robberies, and heist that you can think of coming out of the great state of Ohio, including some of the John Dillinger crimes that were committed. Check out Ohio Heist by Jane Torzillo. You can find that on our website at truecrimegarage.com. Click on the recommended page. Yeah, all the guy wanted to do was go watch a movie and his girlfriend had to turn him in. Ain't that the life. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't live. Oh,